2018, which has prepared this CLE on implicit bias for you today. We are all excited to share with you what we've learned over the last year preparing the CLE, and hopefully you will gain as much from it as we have, particularly with respect to how implicit bias affects us on a daily basis and in the practice of law in particular, as well as hopefully you'll take home some tips on how you can counteract implicit bias uh, in your practice areas as well. Rather than go through in detail the biographies of everyone on the panel, this afternoon I refer you to our written materials. We have a lot to cover in the next hour, so everyone will introduce themselves to you by name and the county that they practice in, but if you'd like to learn more information about an individual, please look at the written materials. Also, we have slides in the materials that will correspond with the slides on the screen, but they do not match the slides on the screen. So they are intended to supplement. There is more material in the written materials that you've been provided with than you will see on the screen. Uh, they'll follow along by topic, and hopefully you'll find them to be a benefit, and you won't, be able to, won't have to take as many notes. They'll be a great resource for after you leave the program today. The topic we're going to cover will be split into three sections. So initially, uh, Don and Katie will cover the definition of implicit bias and why it matters in the practice of law. Uh, next, Mike, Frank, and Jordan will put on an entertaining vignette and open up a discussion on types of implicit bias. And then Sharon will share with us um, whether or not the rules of professional ethics speak to this topic and she'll give you some advice on how you can mitigate implicit bias as you go back into your uh, practice areas following the conference. So before we jump into the definition of implicit bias, I'd like to open up this topic with you by reading a short scenario and ask that you imagine with me uh, as I read it. Feel free to close your eyes and visualize what I'm reading to you and then I'll just have a few short questions before we uh, for move further into the program with Don and Katie. Two kids are driving in a vehicle. They are doing 38 miles per hour in the 35 zone and have music blasting when they pass a police officer. The officer pulls out and starts to follow closely. The kids speed up to 48 in a 45 zone and then as they approach the highway, they speed up to 69 in a 65 zone. At this point, the officer engages the red-blue lights, but the kids don't make any effort to immediately pull over. The officer then engages the siren and sees the brake lights from the kids' vehicle light up, but the kids don't appear to be slowing down. The officer follows the kids for over a mile, and eventually the kids pull over. When the officer approaches the vehicle, there is a very distinct odor wafting from the car. The officer orders the kids out of the car and searches the vehicle and eventually finds a controlled substance. Now I just have a few questions for us to go over. As you pictured the kids in this scenario, were they Asian? Were they black? Were they white? Were they Puerto Rican? Was the police officer a female or a male? Was the police officer, as you imagined them to be, black or white? Did you imagine them to be Asian or Mexican? And the smell that was washing from the car, did you think it was dirty gym clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Rotting food in the back seat? Marijuana? Uh, the loud music that was referenced, did you think it was classic? Classical music or rock music? Um, rap music? Country music? And the controlled substance. Did you think that it was alcohol or drugs? Uh, and are the kids running from the police because they are simply not paying attention? Or, or were they in fact actually running from the police? So hopefully thinking through this exercise has already begun to open your eyes a little bit as to how each of us may have implicit bias, does have implicit bias. Um, and now I'd like to pass this over to Don and Katie to help us uh, further understand the definition and why it matters to us. And we want this to be interactive, so if you have any questions or comments as we're uh, progressing through the CLE, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll entertain those as much as we can with the time that we have.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Don Duong from Monroe County. Um, so how do we define implicit bias? Well, let's, let's split it up. Um, a bias is a preference for or prejudice, prejudice against a person or a group of people. Now, there are three characteristics that make uh, a bias implicit. The first characteristic is that implicit biases operate at a subconscious level. So in other words, outside of our conscious awareness. They're there, but it's hard for us to point those words out. <coughs> second, second characteristic is that implicit biases run um, contrary to our conscious state of beliefs. So while we may be consciously committed to certain unbiased principles or beliefs, subconsciously, um, our behavior and our conduct is inconsistent with those principles or beliefs. So I'm going to give you two examples. Take a CEO of a company who believes and preaches that women should be treated equally in the business place and uh, be promoted to leadership positions. But he would still rather promote a man over an equally qualified woman when he's making that decision. Or a mayor of a town who believes that a better community is one that's diverse. But when she chooses where to live, she would prefer not to live next to a family of color. So in both instances, you have someone who has certain beliefs and principles that are unbiased, but their conduct and behavior runs contrary and inconsistent with those principles or beliefs. The third characteristic, which I think is probably uh, hardest to overcome, is that implicit biases are triggered by rapid and automatic mental associations that we make between people, objects, and ideas, and the, I'm sorry, and the, um, uh, the mental associations that we have between those, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the, the um, let, me, let me back up. <laughs> Implicit by, uh, they're triggered by rapid and automatic mental associations that we make between people's ideas and objects, and the attitudes and stereotypes that we have on those uh, people's ideas and objects. So Malcolm Gladwell was uh, an author that's written several books on psychology, and one book in specific that he wrote was uh, called Blink. And uh, Blink talked about how the brain processes information. Um, and he, s he explained how the brain makes the things fast and makes split-second decisions uh, on an everyday basis. So uh, he said our brain pretty much works like a computer. So when you log onto a website on your computer, um, that the computer will take certain data from that website and will store it in its cache. So it'll take uh, video, it'll take images, it'll take some data. So next time you log on to that website, it'll load it much quicker and will act more efficiently. So that's the way our brain works. So as we go through um, our experiences in life, we'll take certain, certain data that we come across and we'll store it. And it will assign negative feelings or positive feelings to those uh, particular objects or ideas or people that we come across. And uh, so we can retrieve it next time we encounter that situation, uh, we can handle it more efficiently. So let me take, give you a silly example of how this works. Uh, let's say you have an aversion towards blue cars, right? And you just hate blue cars. And every time you come around a blue car, you just don't know, it just irks the crap out of me, these blue cars, mm -hmm. right? And it makes your skin crawl, okay? So, and you can't understand why. So maybe sometime along your life, you had uh, a negative experience with a blue car, okay? So now, your brain stored that negative feeling. So every time you come around a blue car, your brain is saying, bad. Okay? So now you're prejudiced against blue cars. Right? So that's no big deal, right? But what happens if that blue car now is a person? Okay? And your negative, your aversion, or your prejudice, or your bias, or your preference is for someone that's black, or white, or Jewish, or Muslim, or Catholic, or male, or female, or young, or old. So the danger is is when we let our implicit biases uh, guide our everyday decision making and our behavior and lead to discriminatory conduct. So I'm going to show you a, an example here of, um, of what I believe is really implicit bias uh, leading to discriminatory conduct 
really in real life. Um, we have here Cam Newton. I don't know if uh, some of you may be familiar about what happened last year and who was at the press conference. So Cam Newton is a quarterback um, of the Carolina Panthers football team, and he was uh, this post-game press conference, and he had a reporter that was asking him questions. Okay, so he's taking this uh, the, the reporter's questions, and there was a female reporter who uh, uh, asked him a question about his wide receivers and the type of routes they run. Okay, so he was taking the, 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 the question pretty seriously. And uh, you see, look at this, it's refreshing his face, is serious, he's listening to the question. And then she started getting very technical with her, 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 uh, her question about receivers, and she started talking about the type of routes they run. And you can see in the video his expression as her question gets a little more technical, her expression changes, his expression changes from serious to a little smirk and then a smile. And you can see his brain is thinking that maybe this woman who's asking me this question shouldn't be so technical and shouldn't know so much about football or about the technicality of a, of a rap. And then it leads to a discriminatory con uh, comment, an offensive comment that comes out of his mouth. So we're going to play and you'll see how it transitions from from serious to, I don't know if you'll be able to hear her question on the video, but I can't explain what, what's going on. You'll see his smirk on his face, and then he gets back serious and answers the question pretty pretty seriously. So, can we play it? I know you take a, a lot of practice. Yeah, I didn't see your receiver and your wide receivers playing well. Devin Funches has seemed to really embrace the physicality of his routes and, and the getting those extra yards. Does that give you a little bit of an enjoyment to see him kind of trusting people? It's funny to hear a female talk about routes. Like, it's funny. But uh, fun is coming along, man. We're going we're gonna, to, this is a big game for him because of, you know, him being from Detroit. And, um, you know, I know he wants this win extremely bad. And just to see his growth over the years, Completely different player. We're I mean, not just on the field, and uh, you know, I told him and Benji today. You know, those those guys' preparation has been different this year, and um, you know, credit the coaching for it. Um, you know, and, and and just moving forward, you know, we're going to expect those same things. So you see how that how that played out. To me, that's implicit bias, leading to a discriminatory conduct. Welcome to the SB Awards. I'm your host, Peyton Larry. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we follow the footsteps that was of not the other. <laughs> <laughs> that was just an example of bad jokes. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you can see how, how, how his mind was turned, right? And, and, and uh, uh, you know, he was looking at the question, listening to the question, and then he, in his mind, he, he probably didn't realize what he just did. He didn't realize that, that he was very condescending. And just by just by smiling, the way he's treating the, the female reporter, not taking her seriously. So are we treated that way when we walk into uh, uh, judge chambers? Are we treated that way when we uh, walk into our boss's office or when we speak with clients? You know, are they having those those things turning in their mind that they don't even know about? You know, um, so several days after uh, after this, there was a lot of backlash about this, and several days afterwards, he issued a statement. And uh, we go to the next So he issued um, he issued a post conference uh, uh, some statements after the press conference, and he apologized for extremely degrading and disrespectful choice of words in the, in the response to the reporter's question. He said that was not my intention. He says I'm a man who tries to be positive role model in my community and tries to use my platform to inspire others. He also noted that he has two daughters and that at their age I tried to instill in them that they can do, can be anything they want to be. And then he said to the reporters, to the journalists, to the moms, the super moms, to the daughters, the sisters, and the women all around the world, I sincerely apologize. Maybe you believe it, maybe you don't. I, I believe his statements, okay? I believe that he feels that way. And I believe that he does tell his daughters that it could be anything that they want to be. And that their gender shouldn't hold them back. I truly believe that. But that's an ex example of what we talked about before, how um, consciously, consciously you may be committed to certain principles and beliefs that are unbiased, but then your conduct is contrary to those principles and beliefs. So that's the, that's the danger of, of implicit bias, is that we don't know they're there, okay, and they come out um, through offensive behavior.
and maybe offend somebody. Um, so why is this important to us? So implicit biases um, are everywhere. Okay, we all have them, um, and we deal with people as attorneys. We deal with people every day. We deal with the general public. We deal with uh, clients. We deal with colleagues, and we deal with judges. Okay, and. It could affect us in law firm hiring decisions and when we, when we walk into uh, an interview, how we're being perceived. Um, it affects client representation. We're all here, well, everyone here has probably a social media presence, whether it's Facebook, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's a bio on our law firm website, okay, and we have our photos up there. So a lot of times when we have a consultation with a, with a client and we schedule something over the phone for them to come in, they're going to know a lot about us, and they're going to know what we look like before they even before we know anything about them before they come to the office. Because believe it or not, they will visit our websites, they will visit our Facebook pages, and our LinkedIn, and they'll try to see who we are and our law firm, and they'll read our bios, and they may have a an aversion or a, a preference or a prejudice against whether or not we're black or we're white, young or old, male or female, where we went to school, what town we're from. And that may alter their decision on whether or not they're going to hire us. So in client representation, it's very, very critical. Um, jury selection, okay, so I don't know who do jury trials. The way we perceive jurors, the way we pick jurors, you know, what type of uh, implicit biases do we have in picking different people? Um, or how, how, how they view us as attorneys or view our clients, okay? And that can make a decision whether or not they're going to uh, you know, rule in our favor uh, or not. Um, and then dealing with colleagues. Um, you know, how are we treated in the office? Okay? And I'm sure a lot of us have, have experienced certain things. And we're going to do a little uh, vignette here of an, of an office environment where uh, maybe a lot of you will be familiar with. Um, so, after defining implicit bias and going through this and seeing the video, who in here thinks they have no implicit bias? <laughs> None at all. Raise your hand. Okay. Who thinks they have maybe a little bit of implicit bias? Okay, a little bit. And who thinks they are completely biased? <laughs> okay, right there, fill in the back. <laughs> so some of you raised your hand, some of you didn't. I think most people raised their hand. Uh, but we're going to test you now, okay? We're going to show you a test to see whether or not you do have an implicit bias. You'd probably be a little surprised because I think everyone here on the panel has taken this test uh, one time or another and, and we're really shocked um, of how, how biased they, they are. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to, uh, to Katie and she's going to run through the test with you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Katie Nealon and I practice in Lackawanna County. Um, and now that Don has explained to all of you what implicit bias is, I'm here to tell you that you're all biased. But <laughs> it's okay because we all are. Um, we're usually unaware though of the biases that we have, that we possess and that we live with every day and that are reinforced by our society and our culture. To illustrate what biases we all have, I want to take you through an exercise. And this exercise requires some participation, um, so I need you all to stay with me, okay? Um, all you need to do is raise your hand and say either left or right. Um, now before we start, I want to give you some instructions. On the screen you're going to see two categories. We're going to start off on the left with career and family on the right. Flip that. Career on the right, family's on the left, sorry. No, no, no. Which, which way are we doing this? <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, the first way. Family's on your right, career's on your left. It's a little different seeing it at this angle, I'm sorry. <laughs> now you're also going to see a series of words that are going to come up on the screen. And if the word is associated with career, I want you to raise your left hand. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, you got it. And say left. And if the word is associated with family, I want you to raise your right hand and say right. Okay? Okay. Left. Career. 
Correct. <laughs> right. 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 thought that the last set was harder. Now almost everybody should be raising their hands. <laughs> um, not only because I realized I was clicking it a little bit slower the second time around, but this test has been developed by researchers at Harvard who have found that 75% of the population who take this test, uh, their response time on the second, the last set, was a lot slower than on the first set. And that was when male is paired with career and family is, or female is paired with family, the response times get quicker. And you might think that that's because I put the more difficult one last and then you got the hang of the first one. Um, but the research shows that no matter what order this goes in, the results are always the same. There is always a 75% light or high bias towards associating male with career and female with family. 
Now I have to admit, when I took this test for the first time, I thought to myself, I'm a female. I'm not biased against females. I'm going to do great on this test. And I was surprised to find that I did have a slight bias, even in a group that I am a member of, and a group that I am aware of the biases against myself every day, going into the courtroom, meeting with clients, or just being out in society among my peers. I'm aware of the bias against me, and I fight against the bias against me, but yet I still have a slight bias. So that's why it's important to recognize that we all do have biases. And it's okay, because we all have them. But we need to educate ourselves and know what our biases are so that they don't consume our decision making. Okay. And with that, I will turn it, oh, yes? I think it gets confusing too because some of the words are ambiguous, like you manage your home and your family and you manage your career. Or a wedding could be your family, or it could be people that you work with. So you, you hesitate because it's like, well, where does that fit really both? And to be honest, I've, I never thought of it that way. Um, I always placed wedding with family and um, management with career. So I guess maybe that's just a different way of um, our minds thinking and associating these words as well, which goes into why we have these biases. So thank you very much for your comment. And does anybody else have any comments? Or questions, observations? All right, I'm going to turn it over now um, for our vignettes, which will be performed by uh, Jordan, Mike, and Frank. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Lyon, Zone 9, in Montgomery County, and everybody really looked like they enjoyed that. <laughs> the, the, the visual up here from the left to right, that was really funny. Anyway, <laughs> what we're going to do now is do a little bit of role play. Um, I think by the end of it, you're going to want to give Oscars to myself, Frank, and Jordan. And we'll accept them. And we'll accept them gladly. Either that or you're going to be like, they should never act out of scene again. In which case, we'll go back to law practice. In which case, that's not a problem. We're back where we started. No. It's a scene that a, a lot of people in this audience, I think, are going to be familiar with. And if you haven't experienced it, you're probably going to. Um, but it's not being portrayed in the way you think it's going to be portrayed. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put it on. It's not going to take long, so you don't have to bear with us for a couple of minutes. And we'll come back and we'll have some questions about it. And one of the things we actually are, are very interested to hear after we're done is feedback about it, not necessarily the acting, although you can feel free to give us that. <laughs> feedback in your experiences as lawyers and as attorneys and as people, really, as to what you thought of it, any similar experiences, any reactions that you may have had. And then we'll get into a little bit more about the types of biases. But let's do it. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Frank Pagania from Zone 10 in Beaver County. Scene. <laughs> Sam Davis is a young attorney taking the deposition of Steve Johnson, the president of a local bank. Sam has experience in these types of depositions as she has been, spent five years practicing in lender liability, but she has never been to this part of the state before to take a deposition. Johnson and his bank are represented by Jim Smith, an attorney in his mid-50s with nearly 30 years experience. Jim is a well-known attorney in his county and is very well liked by most of his peers. This takes place in Jim's office. This is their story. Uh, good morning, Mr. Johnson. Uh, we're here to take your deposition today. Before we start, I just want to lay some ground rules um, on, play, uh, on the record. So first... I think, excuse me, young lady. I mean, you don't need to go through the instructions for this. We've done this before. Thank you for that, um, but I think it's, it's always better that, you know, we want to make sure that sure the, the answers are... Um, Again, Miss Miss Davis, I, I appreciate your attempts at formalities, I know you're trying to do your job, but I, I think it's pretty clear you're not familiar with the way we do things around here, and, you know, we, we don't do instructions like that. Let me just, let me tell you the way how it usually goes. How it usually goes? Yeah, right. I mean, as you get older and as you get more experience, you're going to understand how useless these instructions tend to be, especially in this part of the state. Now, in fairness to you, you were taught a certain way, and, I'm sure people are telling you how to do this, this type of thing, but you're going to find out that you don't need these types of instructions and these types of things. So we're going to cut midway to the uh, deposition um, where Sam is questioning Steve about a loan document that he uh, provided to a client. So, um, now, Mr. Johnson, you provided this document to my client, didn't you? Yes. So paragraph four talks about the interest rate that will apply to this loan. Did you discuss... Okay, objection. Objection. Ms. Davis, can we move to the to the issues that matter in this case, please? This issue does matter. The interest rate is central to the argument that... You, you, okay, you, you must not do these types of cases very much. 
Great. Let me let me give you a little bit of background because you know I've represented Steve at his bank for 30 years. And I know that all this all that matters in these types of cases is whether your client understood the loan that he was signing up for. And the rate, quite frankly, is irrelevant. With all due respect, Mr. Smith. Oh, yeah, please call, call me Jim. Okay, Jim, but I need to ask these questions. They're important to my case. Again, as, as you take up more of these cases, Ms. Davis, you're going to understand the questions that are important than the ones that simply are not. I, I see a lot of lawyers with more experience than you, and, and they know that they can skip these questions. Well, I think for my case, okay, I am... Move counsel. He's not going to answer that question. And <laughs> Okay, now that I'm done being a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, so, Mike, is it a good sign that I want to punch your character? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually funny, Karen, that you mentioned it. Because the one thing that is funny, like when we did this, we, we, we actually got together at Hershey a couple of months ago at the annual meeting and, and sat down and we had this, this, this scene written out. And we essentially did a table read of it, um, going around the table, and, and there was actually an unbelievably visceral and, and vivid reaction by pretty much every member of the group, one in particular, <coughs> Carrie. <one> in <laughs> and, but it's in fairness to Carrie, I think it was visceral because it was something that pretty much everybody has ever seen. Anybody seen something like that before? Yeah. Yes. I mean, literally everybody in this room is either nodding or, or raising their hand or something. And it's interesting because we're not talking about, in this case, Jim Smith, at least he wasn't intended to be a mean guy. I didn't intend to portray him, but again, don't blame my, my lack of acting skills. <laughs> he's not intended to be a mean guy, right? He's not intended to be a bad person. He's intended, quite frankly, to be a nice person. He believes he's helping Sam out. Mm -hmm. He believes this is what we do. I want to streamline this deposition. She's going to be happy with me because at the end of the day, she's going to get the information that she needs and she's going to go back to her area of the state faster and maybe cheaper for her client than she would have otherwise expected. You know, maybe Jim and Steve walk back to his office and Jim says, boy, that Sam Davis was a really nice person, really nice girl, really nice woman. I hope I get to do cases with her again. Meanwhile, Sam's driving back to her area of the state saying, I hope I never see that shirt again. <laughs> but you're talking about a scene that has had two incredibly different viewpoints for two people who aren't bad people, or at least are not intended to be bad people. Jim Smith is not intended to be somebody who's a jerk. Certainly we have jerks who practice law in this state and across the country, but Jim Smith's not supposed to be one of those guys, yet he exists literally everywhere. And people like that exist literally everywhere. So any, anybody want to care to share any experiences or thoughts or recent history? Yes. Um, so I used to be a public defender, and um, my name is Michelle. But my, last name, but my last name is Ross, which is typically a man's name. So I had a preliminary hearing um, with somebody who was a refill, so he had been in the system a lot. And uh, I had his gun charges, I fought to get his gun charges dismissed at the preliminary hearing level. He went back to the jail, and you know how that works, and told everybody that Ross got him off his charges. So the next guy I had, I went into the jail, and he said, Where's Ross? And I said, that's me, I'm Michelle Ross. And he said, you're a skinny white girl. How could you have been the one that got him off the charges? <laughs> and I said, well, I did. So you either get me or you get nobody, because I'm free. <laughs> and did it, did it have any, if you don't mind my asking, did, did it have any impact on, I mean, did you subsequently represent this guy as well? Yeah, 